we've heard a couple of presentations uh, about some of the startups and, and really innovative efforts that are happening in the voice space. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a step back because um, I'm in the, um, the healthcare world and the enterprise side at a hospital, local Boston Children's, really thinking about how we start to take some of those technologies and bring them, bring them into our organization where we've built up a digital health effort to think about sort of transformational opportunities on the digital world and um, thinking about sort of forward thinking opportunities and voice represents a huge opportunity in the future practice of, uh, of medicine. So screen, you know, this is a shot of a, maybe a physician that looks super delighted with the fact that they're using technology in the workplace right now. The reality is, you know, we've armed physicians with a huge amount of technology, but generally has not made their lives even any easier. They're having to log in to their electronic medical record, huge amount of documentation, changing the way that they actually engage with patients. We give them mobile apps, but ultimately those are just sort of mobile optimized views of the same type of t tools and forcing people with proliferation of, of technologies they have to deal with on their day-to-day -day basis. And of course, the reality also isn't that we're just giving them technology and all of a sudden it's reducing the amount of administrative burden. In fact, it's getting more and more complicated. Um, and even though that we're digitizing all these forms, we're printing them out, we are now having to fill them out. So there's huge amount of work that's happening on the part of a physician and their care team. And in fact, and this is you know, true for Boston Children's, but true for all health systems really out there, that the, the administrative time that, uh, that physicians are spending is way far greater than the amount of time that they're spending with the patient, actually two to one. And in fact, at a much broader scale, we call this sort of formitis, which is the fact that like physicians spend uh, their time with over 20,000 forms every single year that they're filling out, that they have a whole care team that's not like actual trained clinical staff, this is just administrative staff that is surrounding that individual, helping them get through the massive amount of, of burden and weight of paperwork that they're dealing with. And on top of that, it's not creating the, the world that efficiency, the promise of, of technology because there's so much error and, 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 and mistakes that occur from the misuse of the technology itself. And we know that this is true because we have you know, a complicated EHR setup at, at the hospital, both with Cerner and an Epic um, in a highly customized environment. A lot of errors do uh, come through. So what does this mean? Well, we've always been pushing this idea that more digital tools would be helpful, but in fact, they're creating a lot more complexity for our environment, and with that complexity, we know that endangers uh, patient lives. So the whole promise, and I think probably because you're in the room, you're thinking at least there's maybe le this is less of a skeptical audience than, than maybe other places, that sort of the opportunity to unleash natural technology, tools that are much more about direct, you know, um, the, the sort of the essence of the way that we actually want to communicate with patients and our teammates um, has an opportunity to sort of streamline things. So what do I mean by that? Well, there are a whole new set of interfaces that are emerging in clinical care that really take away the need for a huge amount of training for the, for the logins and the, and, and, and the data collection um, and really rely on sort of, uh, sort of more natural engagement. And I think voice is a big part of that. Um, the idea that you can capture natural conversations, use technology in a very natural way beyond the ways of getting trained on it, um, and think about the ways in which one can start to build off of some of those tools. So the opportunity, of course, we see the rise of the smart speaker happening on the consumer front. Um, we're seeing actually it happening at a, at a, at a clip that is uh, sort of unprecedented. Um, there's already mass adoption, whether it's the Google Home or Amazon Alexa, um, and the interactions keep increasing. The amount of times people are going to use voice versus other modalities it, it, it keeps, keeps growing. So our view has been, well, why not start take advantage of, of the, that opportunity, that growth in healthcare? And I, I guess for this audience, really, you already understand why there's been this convergence and opportunity in voice be, between the, the deep learning opportunities, the training sets that, are, that have been built up, um, the cloud computing, all of those together have meant that now is really the opportunity for voice, whereas maybe uh, five, 10 years ago was not. Um, again, probably uh, this group is already familiar with the fact of why we should be, um, whether it's in healthcare or not, super excited about the idea of using a voice because of course you can communicate a huge amount more information, right? So you're going from 
30 words per minute in, in typing to you know, over 140 words in speaking. But not only that, you get incredible other types of metadata, of course, speech and inflections and accents, the background, all of that com combined means that we're getting a richness that you wouldn't get. And I think, obviously, um, the previous talk really highlighted why there's this wealth of, of information. So let's give like one ex example of why, you know, like we're thinking about this. So um, hopefully the volume's working. How do you, how do, you do this? Um, the volume. The volume? Okay, sorry, we'll have to start over here. Okay, one example. So this is a uh, wife texting their husband that they're gonna be late, but here is Honey, an example I'm gonna be late tonight. calling in. So if you heard that, it was a very quick clip. That's uh, that same person, but you can tell that they're in office, so that metadata around you know that, that, that person gives us a lot more information than the pure text. Similarly. Oh, honey, I'm gonna be late tonight. So again, same, same text, but different context, you have an understanding that that person is going to be late um, because they're they're um, you know late at, at an airport. And finally, <laughs> woo! <laughs> How do you happen to be late tonight? So, again, same text, same emoji, but a completely different context, and and obviously captures a very different type of engagement when you're using voice. So our view, of course, from a healthcare perspective, is what are all the other components that you can capture through that level of engagement? The other part of why we're excited about voice from a healthcare perspective is that um, the major companies that we work with today, Amazon, Google, others, are putting a huge amount of investment in these tools. And from that perspective, we're seeing massive amounts of adoption. So why do these companies care about this so much? Well. Well, I don't want to speak for Amazon, but my, my guess is that they, of course, provide a more direct access for people uh, to discover content, discover products, to make, make it a, a more convenient place for them to purchase goods, of course. Um, the sound, of course, and as I just mentioned, the, the ability to capture a lot more uh, richness from that, that engagement. Um, the convenience, you know, you have an always listening device in the home. It makes it incredibly simple to engage and extract information. And of course, um, the intimacy that you capture, you're getting a direct window into people's lives in a way that you couldn't get through some of these other tools. And then of course, cloud computing means that these devices can exist in the home and they're, very, they're not incredibly complicated because they're just mics. All the work that's happening is on the back end. And so these things can be regularly upgraded. And from that perspective, if you think about the cost point of view, you can start to deploy these at massive scale because you're getting them for you know, tens of dollars, if not free, through you know, a bunch of different promotions that are out there. So the idea that you can start to deploy these technologies at scale also means that there's an opportunity from a healthcare perspective to be the embedded healthcare device in the home. So why do we care? Why we're so, at Boston Children's, so excited about voice? It's already, of course, the, the main interface of healthcare. The way that you engage with your, your physician is through voice. The way care teams engage is through, of course, voice. So why not take that engagement and make drive value out of it rather than having the engagement and then forcing people to, to type or to, to engage with technology? So if you think about the sort of the, the process that we've undergone as a hospital, um, 20 years ago, we've been focused on trying to get patients to engage in their patient portal. Like, how do you give them a login to get access to their visit information, their appointment schedules? Really challenging. We've had very low adoption. People just don't have the time to log in and understand a new interface. You know, 10 years later, we had the rise of the mobile apps. So healthcare apps, and you know, we were building these things just like anybody else, trying to figure out ways of engaging and keeping patients adhering to their care protocols and their medications. But again, all it is is another tool that people have to be trained on and have to stick to. Now all of a sudden, you know, we're in the beginning of the decade around voice assistants um, that are sort of um, conversational in nature, so smart assistants. And that changes the game in terms of the level of engagement. It's not just about trying to teach someone how to, build a to, to log into a tool. Now, right out of the box, these things work, and it's a connected, smart device that can engage from a healthcare perspective immediately. My kids, when, they, when we opened up Alexa, we never, there was no instruction manual, there was no login. They just knew exactly what to do, and they've uncovered incredible features of this device that you know, I had no idea that it, that it could provide. 
So um, we've been working closely with Amazon now for several years and trying to build out the wide range of use cases that are, that are potential in this space. And I know we've heard already a couple through the day and I'm trying to build up sort of the, the broad view of how a health system it, it can get very excited about this. So from a home perspective, you start to build in the content that you would provide to your patients um, through voice. So all of a sudden, your care plan or, or the ways in which you want to engage with your health system are all built in into a voice assistant that exists in the home. On the inpatient front, you can imagine huge amounts of opportunity in trying to get um, uh, rooms to be sort of voice enabled and create convenience, as well as create convenience for staff in very busy environments. And then on the outpatient front, and I think that's where we're seeing a huge amount of investment, which is this idea that you can capture the conversation that happens between a physician and patient, structure that conversation, and populate the EHR. And we're seeing companies ranging from Nuance and Google to you know, startups, Notable, uh, Seikara, Suki, all trying to get into this space. Taking slightly different angles, but basically this idea of changing the game of the, of the physician-patient interaction. We think about it a broad set of use cases. So if you think about the full sort of uh, healthcare value chain uh, ecosystem that we're looking at, whether it's clinical efficiency or compliance, looking at the patient experience, um, educational tools, diagnostics, voice has a place in all of these and we're actually have pilots in, in each one of them. Um, and in fact, what's amazing uh, to see that the, the startup ecosystem evolving across all of these different uh, domains has been amazing. Um, you know, a few years ago, most of these companies didn't exist. Now, all of a sudden, there is a flurry of acti activity happening across the, across the full landscape. You know, you can't think of a use case without knowing that there's at least one or two companies that are going after that, that potential opportunity. So, okay, back to Boston Children's. So we're a pediatric hospital, uh, one of the top in the country, focused on rare and complex. We're struggling with a lot of the same issues as most healthcare systems in terms of quality of care delivery, um, uh, physician burnout, improving patient experience, trying to create a more consumer-centric experience. So voice becomes a real opportunity for us to think about a, a wide range of applications. So um, clinical efficiency. So, we have a very complicated environment where we have uh, documents and protocols that are scattered across you know, you know, big, vast areas on the floor, whether they're in fellows rooms or on the main floor or in patient rooms. Um, and it's really challenging. And, and, and the idea that you can start to extract, take all the know-how that is, exists across the, the, like for instance, in an ICU where there's a lot of real important information about dosing instructions, care protocols, staffing, um, even things that have nothing to do with really patient-related information, just general um, evidence-based guidelines. The idea that you can start to build all of that content directly into a connected device becomes a huge opportunity. And so we deployed um, an Alexa-based ICU uh, tool um, t and essentially a menu of questions that, you could, that you know, we provided to fellows and residents and, and, and attendings that they could ask. So it could range from how to, how to properly administer a particular procedure to like who is staffing this bed currently. We then started thinking about other use cases more broadly. Of course, if you think about the issues around compliance and quality of care and, and, and making sure that we're delivering sort of standardized care each and every time, um, the Alexa becomes a really interesting opportunity there too because you can create standardized protocols and checklists that enable us to make sure that we're providing the same sort of routine care, um, especially in sterile environments like surgical units where there isn't this opportunity to scrub in and scrub out and log in and, and get sort of these, these sort of compliance guidelines um, in real time. So we have now uh, have a couple pilots ongoing right now. One is an organ transplant verification. So the idea is that um, there's a protocol around, of course, if you're about to receive an organ, you need to verify that organ, you need to verify the recipient and the locations and the blood types. They're very basic um, verification system, but it, they're challenging to do, especially in these sterile environments. So we implemented this and, and that's, uh, it's going live now. Um, similarly, for a surgical checklist, WHO has very specific guidelines around checklists around performing surgery. Those are things that are widely utilized. 
voice enabling them makes, makes so much sense and that we can start to have these protocols happening while, for instance, you're, you're scrubbing in for surgery. The smart room becomes one that's maybe slightly more obvious and one that's probably more exciting for, for the, from the patient side. We're always struggling with improving the ways in which we um, offer an experience for patients that is beyond just purely their, their, um, the clinical care that they're receiving. Um, you can imagine a lot of our patients don't have easy access to their hands. Um, they often, of course, can still use their voice. The idea that you can start to do things like um, dimming the room, controlling the TV, um, all of those things can all obviously be done by voice, very similar to how Alexa has been deployed in, in you know, across Marion and other places like that. We actually uh, par are partnering with a company that's, I know, uh, partly supported by Amazon called Ava. Um, and we're, we're really excited about them because they're sort of reinventing the nurse call button. So the idea for us is that um, we have you know, a button that someone presses, obviously, and a nurse comes in and then tries to figure out what, what they can do. A voice-assisted call button means that um, you've eliminated the step because someone can use their voice to say that, you know, that they're hungry or they have pain or they need, they need to go to the bathroom. All of a sudden, the voice uh, that's the request is processed through an LP and then turned into a text message and then gets triaged to the right person. So that cuts down time, that eliminates um, you know, the amount of, uh, of effort on the part of our staff because it, uh, requests get triaged to the right person. It improves patient experience, of course. Adherence um, and education is, is a big one and that's probably one that a lot of the companies that are going after thinking about the co consumer healthcare experience for Alexa or Google Home it's another modality to think about uh, adherence to medications, to care protocols, um, general education around particular chronic disease. Again, these are all the kinds of things that you can build directly into Alexa. So in fact, uh, we've launched two skills in that space. Um, our first one was actually called KidsMD. It was, it was actually the first healthcare skill for Alexa, and that was in 2016. And it was, it was this idea, and it was not uh, HIPAA-based because it was just uh, its own isolated platform, but essentially we have all these protocols around acute conditions, whether it's fever or asthma, um, and we have all this information about symptoms and what to do with a certain symptom set. We turned that into a decision support tool that was voice-enabled and launched that uh, with Amazon. Uh, shortly after, we launched another tool called Flu Doctor, and, if, and of course, you're seeing a huge amount of news right now about misinformation on vaccines. The more that we can provide educational interfaces for people to understand the value of vaccines and sort of um, push against the misinformation, this was uh, around influenza vaccines and trying to explain to people why it's important to get a flu shot and, and, and try to guide people to understanding why there's very little risk with, with getting this immunization. But then, um, over time, we've been able to move to a HIPAA compliant environment, and this was an announcement that Amazon made a couple weeks ago, which obviously we were very excited by because it opened up a window into a lot more opportunities in working with Amazon, um, because now we can sign a BAA, similar to the way that we do that with AWS today, and we worked very closely with AWS for many years. Um, but now we can actually uh, do something which is connect the Alexa devices to patient uh, information, and that's through a voice pin and account linking that can occur between the Alexa account and the patient account. We launched a tool, and there was a, a number of different organizations that were part of that launch, mostly on the payer side, a couple health systems. Um, we launched a tool uh, around patient discharge, and our view was that we have a real challenge in getting more continuous engagement with our patients after they've left the hospital, especially for very complex, high-risk procedures like cardiac surgery. So um, what we built was a tool to create um, high-touch um, engagement via Alexa that enables patients to report in about appetite, pain scores, um, activity levels, and it's a, a quick way for parents, because it's usually the parents or guardians that are, of course, doing this, to, ch to, to provide these check-ins and create more continuous assessment that then care teams can reach back out. You can do things like check future appointments and other sort of more basic features, but this is our sort of first uh, toe in the water in building a sort of a HIPAA-compliant experience connected back to our own health system. So what have we learned? Um, well, Definitely there's um, some real enthusiasm. We have massive interest across the health system. Um, 
for the most part, people are getting what they ask for when they, you know, they use Alexa. Um, there is some challenges, especially in very noisy environments, um, and really, you know, so, and we're working to, to improve, of course, the kinds of terms that Alexa can understand. Uh, today, what we're trying to avoid is just adding more complexity, which is what I started this talk by, was saying like we're just throwing more and more tools, creating more complexity, so we're trying to avoid that, and definitely, if there's efficiency loss because people are asking the same questions multiple times, that's not an ideal framework. So we recognize that the, these tools are gonna keep getting better over time, but um, so we're being very cautious about what we're launching and what we're holding back on. And, and the last component, and this is an area that um, um, we're very, uh, very excited about. Actually, Jim spoke about this in the last talk, so you know, he gives a much deeper view. Um, but from our perspective, there's a huge amount more that can be done on the, 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 uh, the data biomarker space. A lot of my personal research has been in digital phenotyping, so the idea that our interactions with technology, um, part of that digital exhaust can give us a view uh, into your health behaviors and outcomes, and we've been doing this a lot for many years with social media and looking at sentiment analysis and ways in which people talk online. But the opportunities that you start to get with voice become incredibly uh, more rich, right? Because with the voice, and, and, and Jim mentioned this, right, you, you have all these other components that you would never get from a social media post on Twitter, your pitch, your tone, your volume, rate, rhythm, all of these components of the way you speak and how that changes over time have real implications for um, various health features, right? So whether it's sort of uh, physical, um, changes that you're experiencing over time, um, like things like your change in your respiration rate, or, or, or more on, on the mind side, right? So looking at emotional state and how one can pick up aberrations through the ways in which we change our voice. So lots of opportunities, and for us, like we're spending a lot of time thinking about the applications that we're now gonna start rolling out um, at the hospital, because again, there's a huge amount of interest, especially in pediatric populations, where there's not a lot of great opportunity for those patients to log and sort of describe their symptoms, but if one can start to extract those, those features, um, you can get some really important signals. And that this is ranges from uh, cognitive disorders to sleep to infectious disease to cardiovascular disease. So the applications are pretty phenomenal. I mean, we've seen study after study show in very small sample sizes, so this is a study from Mayo looking at cor uh, coronary artery disease, um, showing certain features that relate to early indication of, of heart disease. But if you think about the scale of a, of a tool like Alexa, the opportunities to do massive analysis for vocal biomarkers becomes incredibly exciting because now you're doing this at, at populations where, where we're gonna identify things that we just never thought we could um, through some of these data sets. And of course, if you think the full vision of, of, of Alexa becomes um, something even more, either very exciting or very scary depending on who you are, um, you know, there's a listening device in the home detecting for those aberrations or changes in features that ultimately get, gets you into a Q&A with maybe a chatbot tool, throws you into a telemedicine visit that ultimately leads to some form of delivery of your prescription or durable medical good. So the whole sort of uh, healthcare ecosystem can potentially be captured within just that one sort of starting point of a voice interaction. So we'll see if that future actually evolves, but, it's, but it is exciting. Um, you know, we've been thinking a lot about how people are excited or very concerned about this technology. Uh, we published a paper where we actually surveyed physicians from across the country to understand how ready they are for this sort of voice renaissance. And overall, the enthusiasm is pretty significant, but there's, there's of course, concerns around the security that keep coming up, the reliability of the content that we're sort of pushing through these channels, the efficiency again, and, and and are these things ready enough to actually have a natural conversation that they're providing efficiency in, in, the, in the information we're getting, or is it just making a more complicated interaction that could be much done much faster on a phone? And of course, the frustration that that ensues fr from some of that. So I'm just gonna close actually with a video that sort of highlights um, some of the maybe the concerns that were sort of featured by some of our uh, physicians. Um, so I'll just play it here. Playing jazz. Playing jazz. Smoothie. Making smoothie. Calendar. No meetings today. Remember, dentist at 9.30. Fire off. Fire off. Open door. Door open. And we're going to do one more. Oh, yeah. 
Open door. Wrong voice command. Open door. Wrong voice command. Open. Open door. Repeat that. Open door. I didn't understand that. Hey, open door. Play on the floor. Sing on the floor. Get on the floor. Open the door. Wrong voice open the door. Command. Error. Hey, Leon. Good rock. Ah. Uh. Uh. Open door. So, anyways, uh, I think we've probably all experienced an in interaction, um, whether it's whatever smart speaker you're using, um, that obviously has that, um, you know, w that we're taking w these things with a grain of salt. I do want to mention that we're actually putting on, uh, if everybody is in healthcare, there's a HLTH uh, coming up in October. We're putting on a whole voice uh, pavilion and track, working with uh, the Amazon team on that event. So uh, stay tuned for announcements if that's an area of interest. And I'll close it with that. Thank you so much.